Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It's my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation, gender identities, social economic uh, situations, politics, and abilities. And we are advocates for human rights and for the care of the earth. In living this mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. For this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. And so we have been asked to honor them in our service and recognize the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I'll also add the joy that they've had a second buffalo calf born in their community in Oklahoma this week. So yes, yes. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. We recognize how precious it is to gather, how important it is to expand our circles of care. Uh, please help us get to know you. If you are new to us, we have plenty of name tags. We love all the questions. And I invite us to stay for coffee and conversation in Fellowship Hall after the service, or if you're joining us online, Zoom is a good place to chat as well. Uh, please be sure at this moment to check your devices and turn them to worship mode, uh, Android or, or Apple. You know, we are bilingual, so yes. And uh, I have a few notes for today. Uh, first, after service today, we have the hygiene kit assembly to benefit the Children's Home Association of Illinois. Please join us for that. Everybody is welcome to do. Uh, uh, we have and to say how much I love that the congregation likes to play together, because this afternoon we have Mahjong at 1 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Come on and learn a new game and get to know more people. This is great. Uh, next Sunday, we have our annual plant exchange. Uh, bring a few things from home. Uh, we gather them out on the patio, and people will do a little bit of swapping. I think some people make a little donation for the plants as well. And also, I want to invite folks to check out the newsletter uh, that's coming out this week. We have many more things, much more detail, and so on. I want to offer a note uh, for our special guest, uh, Jim Scott, who's coming. He's our uh, guest musician and service leader for next Sunday, May 5th. Uh, he is a Unitarian Versalist. He's based out of New England. He's been playing and creating music and talking about the earth for a long time. Uh, and for many pieces, he's also going to encourage the congregation to sing as well. So I, please invite family, friends. This is going to be a very good experience. And as part of that, uh, I want to provide an opportunity for folks to get to know some of the music. Uh, we will, on Friday night at 6 p.m., May 3rd at 6 p.m., we'll be in here running through the service uh, with Jim and doing a little bit of rehearsing. Um, the congregation is invited, and it was, I'm going to share out, sometime earlier this week, I'm going to share out some of the recordings from some of the pieces I think he's going to offer, and I'll tell you, some of them I've heard for a long time, and it was a joy to have to be able to sing those choruses all over again. So if you'd like to see or hear the music ahead of time also, please let me know. And finally, I welcome the Reverend Beth Monholland as our guest uh, for this morning. Uh, Reverend Beth moved to Champaign with her husband and their three rescue pets uh, last August. You'll rescue pets, go for it. And they, the whole kitten caboodle is settling nicely into their home in Champaign, and she is loving her work with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana Champaign. And while she lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for over 30 years, her roots are in the eastern the hills of eastern Kentucky, and she delights in pulling out the La Appalachian, is New England dire, I said Appalachian, but she's got the Appalachian accent, for important things such as talking to her family or reciting Shakespeare. Very important things, yes. 
And so it's a joy to be able to welcome her. The Central Illinois Universalist ministers uh, were able to return to a practice of doing pulpit swaps over the course of this past year, and we look forward to doing, doing that again in the coming year. And now I'd like to invite Galen Fadley forward for a moment about our annual campaign. Good morning. Our pledges make up 80% of the support for our church's work, providing actions that say yes for justice, inspiring worship services, personal growth and educational opportunities for all ages, service to the community, and a warm welcome to all. Thank you to the 115 families that have already pledged more than 250,000 towards our annual campaign goal of 360,000. 47 families were able to increase their pledges so far, which is so welcome because our work will see increased costs of about 5% in the coming year. The cost increases are a mix of intentional investment in people and initiatives and also core costs increasing outside of our control. We know that at various stages of our lives, our financial circumstances change. Some of us are able to increase our pledges and can help cover for others unable to do so. If you can increase your pledge, please consider doing so. For those of you that are new to pledging, this is the year to begin. A generous matching fund will double your new or reinstated pledge. You also don't have to be a member to pledge. If you simply want this place to exist, your pledge makes it so. Our next threshold is $314,159, and we will be celebrating with pie. Yes, pie for pie. <laughs> Please turn in your pledge by next Sunday. That's a big day, not only for pledges, but it is also the exact date our church was founded 181 years ago. It's the day when you, you musician Jim Scott, will be our guest. It's also the day he will be our guest. If you have any questions or need a pledge for him, we will have a table in, the, in Fellowship Hall. I'd now like to welcome Austin Locke for a story. Thank you, Galen. Hi, I'm Austin Locke. Um, I am the treasurer here, and I've been a member since 2018. The uh, annual campaign asked me to share a story and a short testimonial, so I promise this will be short. Um, and I'm going to dip my toe into politics, but I promise this is not political. It's just for background. Um, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, uh, very, very involved. I went every week. My parents were Presbyterian. Uh, I did. I taught vacation Bible school. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I never really believed what they taught, and I was mostly there for the fellowship and the camaraderie of church, and that's what I liked. Um, I was a Republican, just like my parents were Republicans, and um, up until uh, I went to college, and then I stopped going to church as much, as some people do but I still would visit every once in a while. And the belief systems I put aside because I thought, hey, this is a nice place and I'm have, I have lots of friends. So, you know, that's what church was about for me. And I was Republican up until the time that the, I don't know if everybody here remembers, the Monica Lewinsky incidents. And I didn't really, I was neutral, but then, you know, everybody in the whole country seemed to kind of want to move on from and um, Republicans didn't do that. They kind of like used that as an opportunity to kind of try to get the president out of the office. And I took a look at my beliefs and I thought, hey, am I a conservative? Well, I, I'm not really about guns and I'm not really about church anymore. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm a liberal. <laughs> uh, which was really like a, like a wide opening moment for me because uh, my parents were all liberal. My grandparents, oh, sorry. My parents were conservative and my grandparents were conservative. My whole family is conservative. So it was a big moment for me. Um, and I felt like I was pulling away from the church. I, after, I, after I realized that, I was like, okay, I never went back to my old church. And uh, I moved to Peoria. And in the 2000s, the church and the right started using gay marriage as a wedge issue. 
they started like getting people to really object to gay marriage as to try to get them out to the polls. And I didn't really have an opinion about gay marriage, but I was really like, I was taken aback how somebody could want a complete stranger to not be happy just because of what they do. Like, I, I thought that was just the coolest position. So I, I pulled away from churches and all sorts of churches, and I really didn't want to have anything to do with churches. Until about 2017, when I was driving along the bridge, and I heard an ad on NPR for a church called the UU Church that was welcoming to LGBTQ community. And I thought, oh my gosh, what did I just hear? I'd never thought that the two of those would go together because I had written off all sorts of churches. I didn't want anything to do with churches. What was a church doing welcoming LGBTQ? This must be a new kind of different organization. And I needed to go and check that out. So I went to the website and it was a lot of text. (laughs) And um, I decided to come. And the first thing that I saw was Nancy Rakoff greeting me with a huge smile and friendly conversation. And it was, it was so inviting and warm. And I sat down and Michael Brown was giving a sermon. And of course, it was about baseball. <laughs> for those that remember Michael. And at the end, I wasn't really sure, but at the end, he did the benediction and we all held hands. I don't remember if you guys remember this, but we used to all hold hands. And in that moment, I said, this is the place for me. And I I, I was hooked, and I've been coming back ever since. And because the church, I said yes to the church because the church said yes to the LGBTQ community and broadcasting its values to that community. So I would encourage anybody here, if you haven't pledged and you want to support this organization, So please pledge and say yes to the church. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me for our opening hymn, number 346, Come Sing a Song With Me. It's in the gray hymnal if you want to follow.
I think I'll use this. It's an honor to be with you today in this beautiful space. Thank you all for being here. In religious spaces the world over, when people gather, we often talk about it as a call to worship. And I wonder sometimes what it is we worship when we gather as Unitarian Universalists. And rather than adoration for a deity, I would offer to us that when we gather, worship, worship is the space for us to offer the reverence for the interdependent web of life that connects us all. We gather grieving and uplifted. We gather weary and rejoicing. We gather despairing and hopeful. We gather trusting that when we are together, we will receive what our spirits need even when we do not know it. We gather and we make our space sacred, not because of a god or gods. We make our space sacred with our attention and our intentions. And so I invite you this morning to take a deep breath, whether you are in this physical space or joining us online, take a deep breath with me, with each other, and focus your attention as you breathe in on this moment. And take another breath and focus your intention on being present. And another breath and be fully together. And in this way, we worship. And as Unitarian Universalists across the country do each week, we'll now light our chalice. And I'll invite Julie and Juno to come forward with our chalice words. Morning. <coughs> Written by Catherine Callahan. As, As the, the chalice, chalice is lit, let, let us come, come together into the sacred space we have created. Let the, the cares of the day fall away, 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 and, and know that here is a place for a quiet reflection, for a pause in our lives. For breathing into our true selves, let what is said and felt here add richness to the dimensions of our lives and spiritual practices. We are strong together in community. We share the experience of being human. Let the warmth of the chalice lit during our time together connect us and carry us into the world. I invite us into a moment, into reflection, into pause, into a time where we can bring forth what is in our minds and on our hearts. As we enter into our music for meditation, you are welcome to come forward and light candles with us. Maybe the lighting of a candle can be that intentional act that helps bring forward what is with you. And if you are online, you're welcome to light your own candles or let these be for you as well. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
spirit of community <clears throat> in which we find ourselves, find strength and common purpose. We turn our minds and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need love and support, those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We bring into our circle of care all who are celebrating, who are joyful, who are cherishing, who are looking forward to the end of the school year and feeling a sense of accomplishment or feeling there's a long way to go. For all those, we bring into our circle of care as well. We are part of a web of life that makes us one with all humanity, one with all the universe. And we are grateful for the miracle of consciousness that we share, the consciousness that gives us the power to remember and to love and to care. This is a moment when we share the joys and sorrows of the congregation. I want to offer a note of joy and correction uh, this coming Tuesday, April 30th, uh, Gary Rayfool will be part of the honor flight that brings veterans from Peoria to Washington, D.C. I will admit I accidentally put Gary Hall's name into the Friday news instead of Gary Rayfool. I apologize. Gary and the other veterans will tour important areas around the D.C. area in, on that Tuesday. And it is such uh, a precious thing for them to be able to make this journey, to reconnect with peers and to be at sites such as the Vietnam Memori Veterans Memorial Wall. So we offer congratulations to Gary Rayfool and safe travels. I offer uh, wishes for health to Mary Beth, for Mary Beth Kay offered this note on behalf of her friend Annie, uh, please extend care and prayers to Annie for she has surgery this week. We also recognize in our larger world that this week has been filled with the growing protests at universities around the country and how much those have been conducted in a way that's been peaceful. And we question the severity of the armed responses from the authorities. Let us hold all in our hearts, the protesters and those deployed in all of the challenges of being present and participating and what people are asked to do in the moment. And let us keep calling for witness and for protest and for the call for peace. We also recognize in our larger world how this is the start of Passover as well for the Jewish community, a time of lament and remembering history and remembering a people and also a time of hope and how complex that is in this particular year. I invite us as we enter into a moment of shared quiet to keep in our hearts all who are among us, in particular who are lonely, who, despite being with us in many ways, do not feel connected in just such deep search of love and care. There are many among us that we just don't know. I invite us into one more moment of shared quiet. Let us breathe into this time, the one moment that we know is truly with us. Let us breathe and pause.
Amen. Salam. Shalom. And now we have our story. Our story today is Something Someday by the poet Amanda Gorman. Some of you may know her work. She was the youngest ever presidential inauguration poet back in, uh, what year are we? 2020. Man, that feels like 200 years ago. So this is Something Someday. So Amanda Gorman and Christian Robinson is the illustrator. You are told that this is not a problem, but you're sure there's something wrong. You are told that this cannot be fixed, but you know that you can help. You are told that this is too big for you, but you've seen the tiniest things make a huge difference. You are told this won't work, but how will you know if you never try? You are told to sit and wait, but you know people have already waited too long. You are told that what's going on is very, very sad, but you're not just sad. You're scared. You're confused. You're angry. And maybe, just maybe, a little hopeful. You're told not to hope, but you keep going hoping anyway. Sometimes you feel like you're all alone. But someday, somewhere, you find a friend. Someone who will hope with you, who believes in your dream. Someone who will fight with you. You make a promise to each other. You say, there is a problem, but it's our problem together so we can fix it together. This problem is big, but together we are bigger. You make another friend and tell them it's okay to be sad. And they tell you, sometimes we'll lose, but that's all right. We'll try again. And so you do. Together, working, together, beginning, over and over and over and over. Until you're no longer beginning, you're winning. Suddenly, there's something you're sure is right. Something you know you helped fix. Something small that changed. Something big. Something that worked. Something that makes you feel hopeful, happy, and loved. Something that is not a dream, but the day you live in. Something that makes you smile as you tell someone else. The best is possible. Thank you for listening to the story. Thank you for applauding me. Redefining scattered applause here in the front row. <laughs> and now I invite us to sing out our children and youth and their respective adults to their program for the day. Let us sing Go Now in Peace.
part of our practice in our Unitarian Universalist congregations is to reconnect with how we are the ones who make the church possible, who make it possible in so many ways through our acts of service, through our time, through our knowledge. Let me tell you, the collective knowledge in any Unitarian Universalist congregation would just blow an encyclopedia out of the water. I'm just saying, because. Because we are that abundant in everything that we have around us and within us. And we mark the moment. We take a moment in our service to recognize how the gifts that we have been offering really do make that difference. And so now is the time for our offering during the service. It's a financial gift. And we also share a portion of our financial abundance with our Share the Plate recipient. Uh, each week, we take, uh, as we take up the collection, one third of the undesignated collection goes to our monthly recipient. And this month, we are supporting the Central Illinois Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. They provide programs and services to help meet the emotional, social, cultural, educational needs. And they really have this dream of making the world accessible to everyone. And I think we can all get behind that. Uh, so, let me invite us to share the plate uh, as well as the offering. Two thirds of the undesignated collection goes to the church. One third goes to uh, Central Illinois Blind, for the Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, please make a note on the collection envelope if you'd like to use that. How you'd like, where you'd like the donation to go. Use the QR code in the order of service. And we just updated our text information as well, so we do that also. Thank you for all of the gifts. And now let me invite the ushers to please come forward. Let me invite Jean Burke forward for our reading. She had the big print version. Today's reading is an excerpt from Forest Community, written by Faye Orton Snyder. When I go to the woods, or when I walk in the early morning near the lagoon and watch the sunrise behind a favorite tree, my appreciation for the invisible deep root system is a part of every visit. I sense all that I cannot see. A root system that can be as massive as the trees themselves. How the roots grow into tangles below the forest floor, seeking what they need, nutrients and water. I know too that every tree carries within itself reminders of old wounds, scars that are invisible to me, scars which have been absorbed and integrated into the body of the tree, patiently covered by its growing edge, little by little, year after year. And I remember that new roots and the old gnarly roots are all part of the family of life 
that extends above and below the forest floor. Like a forest, what sustains the members of a community and a family can often be felt, but not directly seen. So much happens below the surface of the work in the undergirding, supporting, and delivering. When I think about the world's forests being clear-cut for short-term economic gain, I wonder if we know that what we're doing above is having a real impact on the community below. I know how easy it is to do things on the surface without regard for the depth that is also present. Likewise, when we pass through each other's lives without care for the depth of life lived, traditions gathered, memories made, prayers answered, challenges met, and outcomes received, we sever the deep down things. Those things that are hidden deep down inside side of each of us, what keeps us close to our birthright gifts, what allows us to remain in the strong fabric of the examined life. Our root system is the wisdom we carry. And it is the community that we help find, help one another find and celebrate the root of our own story, our strength, survival, and need for one another. Like a forest, we thrive together because we share a world. I invite us to rise and body your spirit for our hymn number 354. Uh, Kathy's going to definitely play it all the way through. I want to invite us to sing into it as we pick it up. And I just want to offer that it is by the late Shelley Jackson Denham, one of our other wonderful Unitarian Universalist musicians I had the pleasure to know personally. And I'm just so glad that she gave one of this piece, this piece as a musical gift to the world. Please join me for our hymn number 354. It's in the gray hymnal as well.
I'll come back to there. Um, but I'll start here. I want to tell you all a story. I uh, started running, and I do use the term loosely in relation to myself, um, in the spring, literally on the spring equinox in 2010. My husband and several of our friends, we were all in our mid to late 30s and feeling, I don't know, very sedentary and lazy. So we decided to start a couch to 5K program just to get fit and get moving and try something new. My husband and one of our friends had both been athletes and runners when they were younger. And so this was their idea. And they were like, it'll be fun, everybody. Well, guess what, folks? It was not fun. I hated running. I thought it was the dumbest thing anyone had ever done. And I distinctly remember later that summer when I finished my first official 5K saying out loud, well, I don't ever want to do that again. And I will never run any farther than this. Which were like famous last words, right? Because I did actually keep running. And sometime towards the end of the second year of running, I, I realized that without my knowing it, I had come to actually like running a little that I didn't think it was the dumbest thing ever. And much to everyone's surprise, when we were planning our training for year three, I'm the one that suggested, let's go farther this time. And so we started training for quarter marathons, which are 6.2 miles, and then half marathons. And we started running, we became runners. Like we were running three and four half marathons every year. And so, Sometime during my fourth half marathon, which if you don't know, it's 13.1 miles, which really is a ridiculous amount of time to be running, but I loved it. But it was during my fourth half marathon, and it took place in Madison, Wisconsin. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to Madison, but it's actually got similar terrain to, to here in Peoria. And uh, the half marathon was in August, which was similar heat and humidity to what you get here in Peoria. Wonderful time to be running on. But on the morning of that half marathon, it was cloudy and kind of cool, really great running conditions. I felt wonderful. And for the first seven miles of that race, I was running faster than any other race I had ever done. And I thought, I'm going to own this race. But then in mile eight, you started winding through the Madison Arboretum, which is flat, um, which was nice, but also muggy as heck. You were surrounded by water and trees that were just far enough away from the trail that you didn't get any shade. The sun came out, the wind stopped moving, and by the end of mile eight, my knees started hurting. And that fast pace I had keeping slowed down. And by the time we got to mile nine, I thought, oh, this is not good. And then mile 10 went uphill out of the arboretum. And I'm not kidding you. I thought, why the heck did I pay to do this? <laughs> and I just wanted to quit. But there were still 3.1 miles left to go to that finish line. So I'm trudging up the hill. But as I got to the top of the hill, we came out of the arboretum and moved into a neighborhood where spectators were cheering us on. And this woman and a little probably five-year-old kid were standing there cheering. But more importantly, they had a cooler, and they were handing out popsicles. And I took a popsicle from that five-year-old, and she gave me a high five, and she said, you can do it. And to this day, I'm convinced that that popsicle and that high five from the five-year-old stranger, if not saved my life, at least, at least gave me the strength to keep going for the end of that race. And I think, as I think about that moment, that's when it became clear to me how I'm gonna lose this. How powerful community can be. There is uh, it's attributed as an African proverb, and I hate saying that because Africa is a giant continent with many countries and ethnicities. But no matter how much I've looked it up, that's all I ever found. But it goes like this: If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And some things can be done much faster when we do them alone. And anyone who has ever done group work, or I don't know, served on a church committee, can attest that things are less efficient when you get several people together. But efficient and fast are not always the best answer. And community 
community can be the key to help us collectively go farther than we think we can. And staying in the running community, to illustrate this a little more, I want to tell you about Shailene Flanagan. Now, is anybody in here a runner or a fan of the game? Okay, a couple of people. Somebody's like, so none of you then therefore know who Shailene Flanagan is. But Shailene, she's now a retired elite runner. But she won the New York City Marathon in 2017 at a, a blistering fast pace of two hours and 26 minutes. She ran 26 miles in two and a half hours, which, by the way, is the best time for my half marathon. So hats off to Shalene. But Shalene turned pro in 2004 after a really successful college career, and she trained tirelessly. She ended up going to four Olympics with the U.S. team, and she was actually the top American finisher at the Rio Olympics in, for the Olympic marathon in 2004. And she had been competing for that prize for years. But what gave her an edge in that 2016 Olympics was the kind of training that she had started to do. Training that was actually unique among competitive runners, especially women runners. And people back in the mid-2010s used to say that Shalene's training, they called it the Shalene effect. Because starting in 2009, she joined a running club in Portland and was the sole woman on that team. She intentionally started recruiting other women into training with her. She built a community of runners focused on nurturing talent to elevate them individually and collectively. They focused together on helping each other improve, supporting each other through struggles and triumphs, and it worked. A New York Times article in 2017 after Shailene won the New York Marathon, said this, that that group of runners became the most formidable group of distance athletes in the nation. That group of women outperformed the men in their club. They won multiple world championships and saw nearly every single woman on their team make it in, onto the Olympics. In working together, they raised their individual performance to new heights. And they also truly helped each other grow. For the Olympic trials in 2016, Flanagan and a teammate were running side by side, and they had a solid lead on every other runner. But then Flanagan started to falter. In the final few miles of the race, she was really struggling with her water intake, with cramping in her legs. And her teammate, who could have just kept going, actually stayed by her side, encouraged her, and even started just bringing her water so that she plan again could just focus on running. Together, they ended up finishing that race strong, and both of them qualified for the Olympic team. When asked later why she stayed with plan again when she could have just gone on, the teammate said, Shalene, Shalene has done that same thing for me, and so of course I'm going to be there for her. And Flanagan herself said, look, I thoroughly enjoy working with other women. I think it makes me a better athlete in person. It allows me to have more passion toward my training and racing. And she said this, when we achieve great things alone, it doesn't feel as special. And so again, Flanagan is now retired, but her career reached the heights it did because she pioneered a different kind of competitive mentoring that said, yes, of course, we're going fast. We're elite runners but we are going far, farther than any one of us has gone before because we are going together. And therein, I think, lies the power of community. Because yes, we can accomplish things on our own, but we can accomplish more together. And when that togetherness is in pursuit of goals and shared values, when we strive to bring out the best in each other, real progress happens. And in the wider scheme of things, to quote Helen Keller, alone we do so little, but together we can do so much. Civil rights leader Ella Baker, who is one of my heroes, is a shining example for us in this, in the broader aspects of life. If you don't know Ella Baker, it is my pleasure to introduce you to her this morning. But she was an activist for more than 50 years, starting in the 1930s. She was a pivotal leader in the civil rights movement. 
She led, held national positions with the NAACP and the Southern Christian Leadership Council. And in 1960, it was Ella Baker who was instrumental in guiding the formation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which came to be known as SNCC. And if you do not know, SNCC was the group of young college kids who were responsible for the voter registration drives in the South throughout the 60s. Baker herself was often critical of the top-down hierarchical leadership that disadvantaged the already disadvantaged. Her style of leadership was grounded in community building. Or as Color Line so eloquently puts it, Baker was invested in everyday people channeling their collective power to resist oppression and fight for sustainable, transformative change. And therein, for me, lies the, a key purpose of community. We come together in community, especially spiritual communities like our UU churches, because we know the work of creating the world that we want to leave for our children, grandchildren, is too much for any one of us to do alone. We know, as Baker knew, that sustainable change doesn't happen fast, and that the distance we need to go to make justice a reality for everyone means we must work with others. In community, we pool our resources. We offer different perspectives to solve problems. We support each other when the work starts to weigh on us. Baker's work shows us that we can and must focus on common goals, elevate each other's strengths, and importantly, for all of us, but especially those of us in covenantal spaces like a UU church, we must provide accountability. Because if the power of community is that we can accomplish more together, and part of the purpose is to create sustainable change, then a piece of that change is to be held accountable when we stumble, when, not if. Accountability within community helps us to transform not only our systems, but ourselves. Years ago, years ago, I hurt a very dear friend of mine with careless words and actions. And the harm I did was unintentional, but it was deep. And my friend screwed up her courage to tell me that she needed a break from our friendship, that my presence was too difficult for her to handle, that she needed me to change my actions in order to rebuild trust with and as painful as it was for me to hear that, as painful as it was for her to say, that moment propelled me into self-reflection and into much-needed change. I became a better friend, not because I had messed up, but because I was held accountable for the mistake that I made. I was held accountable in love and given the opportunity to rebuild trust. That is what community can offer to all of us at its very best. There is another side to community that's worth exploring, and that is our very real human tendency to build human community by building a wall. We like to belong. As humans, it's a basic need right up there with food and water and shelter. But we have a, a nasty tendency to find belonging by excluding others, by creating categories of us. And then, and we have only to look at our current socio-political landscape across the world to recognize that. We close our circles all too often, but we can widen them. A few months before the presidential election in 2016, I read a story in Al Jazeera that highlighted a community that had intentionally widened its circles. The reporter had gone to visit eastern Kentucky, honestly, just about three hours directly east into the mountains from where I was born. They visited the college town of Pikeville, Kentucky, where Eastern Kentucky University is. And much to my surprise to learn from this story, there is a thriving Muslim community with a mosque that serves a six-county region there. And the story highlighted how the people in that area had come to embrace and often protect their Muslim neighbors and how interfaith activities had become a norm. 
And one of the things that sticks with me all these years later is something that a college professor said in that article. He said, in Pikeville, you have two pockets of people who are often made to feel outside of the American mainstream, rural Appalachians and American Muslims. Here, they had found commonalities in their religion, in their dedication to family, and the belief in the homes that they were making for their children. They become a united community, broken down us and them, not because of their differences, but through them. And that is a key power and purpose of community. That when we feel alone because of some aspect of our identity, when we feel alone because the world is tearing itself apart, we remember that we have people we can rely on. The work of living can be so hard. We burn out, especially when we do too much alone, when we carry too much ourselves, when we put our noses to the grindstone, forgetting to raise our heads and to look up and see the amazing communities to which we belong, to see the people who are walking with us even in our loneliest hours. We need to be reminded daily that we are not alone. And that, for me, is the why of community. It is especially the why of spiritual community. Because we come together on Sunday mornings when we could be doing other things. We could be having coffee with our families, going out to brunch, or just sleeping in. But we know that we need to be reminded that as we want to remake this world, we must do it together. On that day in that race in Madison, and I was climbing up that hill and thought I couldn't make it, and that kid handed me that popsicle, saving my life. I actually said out loud as I lifted and trudged on up the hill, oh, this saved my life. And then much to my surprise, from just behind me, I heard a voice say, I know, me too. And I hadn't even realized in my overheated exhaustion that somebody else was that close to me. But I laughed and turned and looked at the person who'd said it, and we toasted our popsicles with each other. And we actually finished two strangers together, finished that race. As we move forward into this very turbulent year, that has already been full of war and suffering with another contentious election looming. We know we will have births to celebrate and deaths to grieve. We know we are going to continue facing political strife that's demanding our attention, injustices demanding our action. And we have to know and trust that on whatever paths we find ourselves, we can answer the call of help from nearby strangers. May we offer to carry each other. May we accept water from someone when they offer it to us. May we offer a literal or figurative popsicle as we keep each other company. And may we remember and remind each other that we are not alone on this road. We are going far because we are going together. May it be so. And in the spirit of togetherness, I'd like to invite you to stand in body or spirit for our closing hymn, which is 1021 in your teal hymnal, Lean on Me.
As we extinguish this flame, let us ignite inside ourselves. Our commitment to our mission and to one another is unquenchable. Let us remember that we are not alone and that this flame will return next time. So may it be. I ask you to enter into just a spirit of prayer as we close today. And I offer us this spirit of life and love. Hold us together even as we go our separate ways today. Whatever we carry in the days to come, remind us that we are not alone, that we are loved, we are enough. Amen, and may it be so.